businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We are happy to have in the studio today Landon and I. This is Austin Peterson, your host, Landon, the co-host. We're happy to have Michael Zal with Yellowbird in the studio today, and you don't see him or hear him, but his son Nick is here observing. So we've got a young tycoon that's getting ready to, uh, to get uh, you know, launch his career in the next few years as well. So we're excited to have both of you in the studio today. Michael, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so Michael, you're a, you're a tech CEO. Yellowbird doesn't tell any of us what Yellowbird <laughs> does, right? Um, but before we have you jump into Yellowbird and, and uh, you know, your, your endeavors here in terms of Yellowbird and everything that you're trying to accomplish there, why don't you kind of back up and tell us a little bit about your family? So we know you've got at least one child, but give us a, a little bit of background in your family and how we got to where we are today. Absolutely. My favorite subject. So uh, I have been uh, happily married for 20 years this uh, in August um, from Southern California. I um, recently moved here about two years ago. Um, I'm from Orange County, California. Had a, a great career and great um, um, family and life in, in, uh, in California. The reason we moved out here was multifaceted. My, uh, my wife's family is from here and her mother uh, um, was, um, is, uh, has Alzheimer's and so has been kind of combating that, uh, that horrible disease. And, and so we brought her out here to be closer to her family and uh, we wanted to be here as well. Um, along with my wife, uh, Jennifer, I have a daughter who's 11. Her name is uh, uh, Josie, and I have my son, Nick. Um, Nick goes to Brophy, and uh, Josie goes to St. John, and um, we absolutely love this community. We love being here, um, even at 110 degrees. I am still <laughs> thrilled to be here. Hey, today's only 98. I noticed you had the jacket on today, so I just figure once the calendar turns to May, I'm not wearing a jacket again until October or November, so... <laughs> I appreciate the uh, the desire to put that jacket on today. And uh, obviously, we've got some background in Orange County. We talked a little bit before uh, the show started. My wife was born and raised in Irvine, so know the area very well. My wife and I lived there together as a married couple um, for about, uh, I want to say, nine years or so. And then the co-host, Landon, uh, was born and raised in, in Southern California as well. So we're all Southern Californian to a, to a certain extent. There you go. And uh, by the way, I'm, st I'm celebrating my 21st wedding anniversary in August uh, this year as well. So August 14th, 1998. Did you hear that, honey? I got the, <laughs> I got the, uh, the actual date correct. So uh, He had to write uh, that on his hand. Just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he said August in 20 years, I'm like, wait a minute. That's pretty close to mine. Let's do the math. No. Um, but no, we're, we're grateful to hear about your family. We're glad that you, that you enjoy it here. I moved here personally six years ago. And mm -hmm. so uh, it took us longer than two years to make that adjustment to, uh, to the temperature. But it was family that brought us here as well. And so um, family and some business opportunities for me mm -hmm. personally. But uh, my wife has a sister that's lived here in Gilbert for more than 25 years now. Yep. And we, my brother-in-law tried to convince us probably... You know, we've been married 21 years. He probably tried to convince us 20 years ago to mm -hmm. move here when he and I were golfing on Thanksgiving and he's pointing to this house and saying, you can buy that house for $90,000. <laughs> and, and I still didn't want to leave Southern California, my, my half million dollar town home at the time. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, but you know, we've come full circle. And we're here now. So, well, it's a double-edged sword. You know, they, uh, likewise, my family has been my wife's family. It's been coming out to Southern California to, and we were very blessed to have a, have the space. We had a nice home and um, every summer when it hit 110 degrees plus, the whole family would come and we didn't have that big of a home, but we had enough space that everybody would pretty much bunk up and um, they got what they asked for. And now nobody gets to leave the Valley here in the summertime and stay at my house. So uh, <laughs> it was a double-edged sword. They, they got us full time and now they lost their, uh, their Southern California getaway. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, trust me. I, I understand that completely. My wife's parents were some of the, the very first residents of Irvine. They moved there in 1969. Wow. And have lived in the same house ever since. And, and same thing. The whole extended family congregates at their house every summer until mm-hmm. COVID-19 hits. And now nobody's there. I yes. would actually be there this week, typically. Um, but unfortunately, with COVID-19, with my wife's parents being 91 and 86, yep. nobody's yep. going anywhere near that house. So. Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, no, I I appreciate the background and the you know giving us some information about your family. That's really what we, that's what drives all of us, right? Absolutely, I mean, that's why we do what we do. Absolutely, my yeah. folks actually, uh, and they they swore they never would leave Southern California. They went to uh, uh, Hamilton High School in Los Angeles. That's where they met um, fifty probably fifty five years ago is when they met at Hammy High and um, in Los Angeles, and they actually just moved out here about a year and a half ago oh, wow. um, to, and I think partially to be closer to us, partially, um, you know, they found a great retirement community and, um, um, uh, trilogy. Yeah. Um, so they, they're enjoying that, but, uh, yeah, you know, maybe we're pulling them out here one by one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no way my wife's parents come here. <laughs> they, they visited a few times, but there's, there's no way my father-in-law, even at 91, he, he likes to go to the beach a couple times a week. There's no way he moves. Good for he him. Here, Good so. for him. Yeah. Very active, still very healthy. He's had some heart issues over the years, but still, still very, very healthy. So, well, let's jump into what we're here for. We're going to talk about uh, Yellow Bird and really just kind of your background as a tech entrepreneur. And so, you know, nowadays, all we hear about is the gig economy, <laughs> right? And yes. it's been in the news specifically with Paycheck Protection Program and, you know, how do we deal with this and how do we help these people that are working in the gig economy? And so, you know, tell us a little bit about what you've learned about starting exactly that, a gig economy marketplace. You know, it's an interesting subject because they're calling it the gig economy and, and it's a very flashy uh, statement and tagline. But the reality is, is that professional consulting, side businesses, side hustle. Um, people have been doing it for years. They really have. The difference is, is that what we're doing in today's gig economy is we're leveraging technology to make it seamless and to make it easy for the people to find the gigs and to match the gigs. So in my world, it's a highly skilled gig economy. It's not, an, um, it's not just a, a body pool or a labor pool of any labor, um, but rather we, we are moving up scale up up market to focus primarily on environmental health and safety professionals. So they have to be certified. They have to have education, licenses, um, a lot of other things that play into their world. But the reality is, is that everybody I know, and I guarantee that if I, when I say this to you, you're all going to nod. Um, when you get ready for retirement and people go, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to golf all day long? And they're, well, you know, I'm going to do some consulting. I mean, it's, it is the professional response that yeah. I'm not getting out of the game. I'm going to stay in the game. I'm, going to, I'm just going to do it on, on my terms. And the reality is that most of those people, and my father included, um, they, they have great intent. They make their letterhead. They, they get business cards. They probably even incorporate. And if it becomes a little challenging, which it does, you know, they're golfing more and they're consulting less, especially if they're not doing it for the income. Yeah. Um, per se, you know. Yeah. And so what I love about what we're doing and what the gig economy in general is doing is it's streamlining getting the best people to the best locations efficiently using tech. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And I think, you know, Landon and I, with what we do, we, we talk to people who are nearing retirement all the time. We specialize in working with business owners. And so when you're building, building, building forever, and then all of a sudden you're supposed to cross that threshold into retirement, it, it's a tough adjustment regardless. And Absolutely. so everybody wants to still stay involved somehow, right? They don't necessarily want to go be a greeter at Walmart, right. but they do want to still do something. And retirement's kind of become a bad word nowadays. Sure. And so, you know, Landon and I talk about financial independence. It's not about retiring. It's about working, choosing to work, not having to work for an income. So I, uh, the story of Yellowbird, and I don't mean to monopolize the conversation, oh, but um, the story of Yellowbird actually began with a senior officer. He was actually a colonel in the Chilean Air Force, literally driving me in an Uber at 530 in the morning. <laughs> it's a true story, and I wouldn't believe it if I didn't experience it. And 
articulate, well-mannered, got out of his car, very professional. You could tell this guy was sharp and, um, you know, maybe mid sixties. And I asked him, you know, how do you end up driving for Uber? And he said, well, my, as he put it, my grandbabies were being born in, in Arizona. So we moved up here to be there and he couldn't sit on the couch. And he said, I was, I was going out of my mind. And so I'm driving Uber just to stay engaged in the community, which I thought was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I also thought in the back of my head, which started me down this journey. Wow. With all of his knowledge, with all of his experiences, life experience and training people. And, and just, he is a, I mean, this guy is a, a wealth of knowledge and he's, um, driving an Uber and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's so much more that he could be doing. And then I uh, was having a conversation with a friend of mine and I, um, and to be really honest, I don't remember who this person was and I feel badly because they said the greatest quote, um, and uh, we stole it from somewhere. So I can't give credit to the person, but there's an old saying and it's an, uh, a native American saying that basically says that when an elder dies, it's like burning a library. Mm. And I think about that quote a lot. And I actually have used that quote when I, one of the reasons I'm wearing a coat, by the way, is because I'm raising money all day long every day. It feels like, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, no offense. I mean, I, I would have worn it for you too, but sure, I, sure, I, sure. Have to always, <laughs> I haven't always have a coat, <laughs> but that saying of, you know, when an elder dies, it's like burning a library. I think of the same thing in the business community. You know, we do not have people that are taking over on these roles. And so more often than not, it's an abrupt halt to a knowledge base. Um, you know, there's, you know, they use the term tribal knowledge or working knowledge or industry knowledge, whatever you call it. These folks, they'll give three weeks, a month, maybe two months of transition to whom we don't know at all times. And then they're gone. Yeah. And then nine times out of 10, they're called back and say, Hey, will you do some consulting for us to, yeah. say, you know, to train your replacement? And that was among the other conversation that I had that I said, you know, I got to make an easy way for that to happen. Yeah. And so that was kind of the, that was the edifice of this process. Yeah. It's hmm. always great to hear how, how ideas come about. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, um, not, not that you are an elder by any means, but <laughs> just reading your, reading your bio and your experience, um, which, which all is really cool. I mean, this is one of my favorite parts of this show is being able to, you know, read about you and your company and your past and just learn about you as a business person and, and as a man. And I'd like to hear just a little bit more about your background just before we dive a little bit deeper into Yellowbird. You've got a really interesting background. You've started and sold companies. Um, you've got an extensive background in, in tech and as a serial entrepreneur. So talk to us a little bit about some of your past endeavors and what you've done. and that'll kind of just help set the stage as we move forward in the conversation, you know, and flow into Yellowbird. Sure. Happy to. Um, you know, it's funny when you're, when you're doing these various things, they don't seem that, they don't seem that interesting. I mean, they're fun. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do them because I love it, but uh, it's not like, I don't think anybody, if you looked at your resume, go, wow, I planned that out. In fact, quite the contrary, <laughs> quite the contrary. It's, it's, I sometimes felt like I was a uh, ping pong ball or a feather in the wind at times. Um, by the way, for career advice, never run your career like feather in the wind. That's a horrible strategy. <laughs> um, but I am, I am somewhat of the, of the lifelong um, opportunist. Um, and when I say opportunist, I don't mean it in a negative way, which a lot of people take it that way. But I always have had this sense of finding opportunity for my customer, um, first and foremost. And when I do that, my customers have often found opportunity for me. Um, and so that's how I've built my businesses over, over the years. I started really young, um, not much older than my 15-year-old son over here, Nick. Um, I was selling computers. Uh, I was recruited to sell computers because I always looked a little bit older than I am. Um, not anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I, was a, I was a doorman at a, a movie theater. I was asked if uh, what I knew about computers because I, I was very friendly with my with my patrons and I got to know them by name when they came through the door on Friday nights. At, uh, from those in Newport Beach area, I was at Triangle Square Theater uh, at the uh, <laughs> at the end of the 55 freeway. So it, tell, it tells you a little bit about us. Yeah. Um, and so um, 
I got into selling computers. I was very successful at doing it at a young age. I was doing it after high school. And it was, I think, a natural gift. Honestly, I, I've always liked people. I've had an, um, a, an affinity towards tech. I like technology. I've been able to kind of convert technology into usable um, performance. And so, you know, when you're talking about RAM and ROM and, and processor speeds and all that stuff, especially back then in the, in the early 90s, I, I knew what it meant um, just natively. I don't know why, but I was good at it. And then I got into the internet business when the internet was a fad, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> uh, that was what the number one argument was. And so I was in sales um, for a young startup. Um, that's where I w met my wife eventually. I'll get there in a moment. But I was very fortunate to be at a young startup internet company that was selling internet access to the public internet access to businesses back when nobody really wanted it or needed it. And in fact, we actually sold the first hosted uh, server to Amazon. Wow. Uh, it was one of my claim to fame. Uh, promptly left us and built their own data center, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> they gave you a stock. <laughs> no, they did not. No, they did not, unfortunately. Um, but over the period, I've been, in very, I've been very fortunate to be at the right place at the right time. Um, and I've been willing to take risk. So... If I had a big commission check, I'd ask if I could take it in stock. If I was working with a customer who had an opportunity that they're trying to expand a building and they wanted me to invest in it, um, I was able to do that. Um, every time I've ever started anything or been involved with anything, I was quote unquote poached uh, by a customer or a advisor or a mentor. So my number one rule is I always keep my eyes open. Um, that's also cost me a lot of money. I was fortunate enough to meet some great guys at the wrong time. I, uh, I was part of a de novo bank, which essentially is a startup bank. If anybody knows about banking, de novo is a fancy word for just saying startup um, in the banking world. You go through the process of getting FDIC coverage and uh, insurance, and you go to DFI, Department of Financial Institutions, and um, put your money in it quite a bit. And uh, you, with a group of people, start a bank. Uh, that was 2007. <laughs> I, I seem to remember some sort of a financial crisis a year or two later yeah that was a so no that bank never opened um great experience but you know it, everybody talks about all the great and it, it was great don't get me wrong it was expensive but it was great i learned so much and i i'm so grateful for for that process because it, it really taught me a ton about what it was like to truly, truly bootstrap something I didn't understand at all. Yeah. Um, but they asked me to be involved because it was a startup, um, small business bank um, in Irvine. Um, and um, I was the tech guy who they were going after. They wanted me to move the accounts over and so forth, which I understand. Um, but they also wanted to understand how to serve the market. And I thought we were doing a good job. Um, yeah. Just timing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I've got a story there, but uh, it's for another day. I, I, yeah. I was involved in some real estate development opportunities at that same time period and, ah, yes. <laughs> and uh, lost my shirt, so to speak, yeah, and we, maybe we've everything there. else. <laughs> we've, <laughs> so, all, we've all been there, man. Yeah. You know what? That's what makes you who you are. You have to earn these gray hairs. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't have any hair left, but what I do yeah, have is gray. Yeah, so. you have gray on your chin. Yeah. Like mine. Like mine. Yeah, you're not alone. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, after that, no, I'll finish the, the tale of Michael Zhao. Um, I, uh, when I got out of this um, internet um, fiber business, I got into the satellite business. And so the satellite communications business is primarily focused around, which is a full circle of Yellowbird, by the way, um, environmental health and safety. And the number one driver in all high risk environments is can you keep your people safe? And so when you're selling satellite, if you're building an oil and gas site, if you're doing a construction site in the middle of nowhere, in my case, I was doing a lot of emergency management, emergency response, so FEMA and people like that. Um, what happens if all the telephones go offline and somebody gets injured? And so you start serving the EHS, the Environmental Health and Safety Officers. Um, they are your customer, and you explain to them, look, I understand the importance of um, making a phone call. I understand the importance of a 911 um, and 
Secondarily, you also want to be able to count your barrels of oil as they come out, and we can help you with that too. But the primary was health and safety. And so being you know, a good steward of my customer, they would also ask, I'd talk to them about their problems and how I could help them. And the number one point that they would come up with is people. Um, you know, we're having, we had to spill. It happens a lot, unfortunately. Do you have anybody who's a hazmat specialist or do you know somebody who um, is, understands um, how to, um, you know, scaffolding safety or construction safety or we're doing a project out here and we can't find good people. Do you know anybody? We have that a lot. And that was the, one of the starting points uh, along with these conversations in Uber and these other discussions, but that whole process got me thinking, you know, there's gotta be a better way of matching and which is all we do. We, we match codes and pros. We match companies and professionals. That's yeah. the simplest way of describing what I do for a living is we're a co and pro matching company. Yeah. And specifically in the environmental industry, right? Health and safety. Well, the industry per se is uh, prim- primary, um, the primary focus of the industry is construction and manufacturing. Um, so if you want to take a vertical, however, COVID has changed that a lot. And we'll yeah. probably will talk about that. Uh, we've taken a little bit of a, of a uh, I won't say it's a left turn because it really isn't. It's still industrial hygiene is a, is absolutely an environmental health and safety um, um, service. So we're not really making a left turn on the highway, but what we are doing is we're not doing as much construction and manufacturing as we were doing in January. Um, now we're doing a lot of COVID return to work plans for companies. And particularly the focus for us is how do we make small business and mid-sized business comfortable that they, yes, we all have our hand sanitizers and Lysol and, and you know, and doing it the best we can do. Right. But are we doing surface testing? Are we testing the HVAC systems? Are we putting a plan in place that we can actually go to our employees and say we feel comfortable with where we are? Yeah. So. Yeah, you're, you feel comfortable having them come back. And then as an employer, you're more comfortable from a liability standpoint because I don't think there's still a solution or a decision, so to speak, around how all that's going to shake out. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, you know, the... The laws associated with this and particularly corporate liability is really evolving and it's um, going to keep a lot of attorneys in business for a very long time, unfortunately. Recently, there was a statement that was made and I don't know if it was actually put into um, law or not, but I believe that there was an understanding that it would be considered a recordable if you got COVID at the workplace. And that doesn't mean anything to you guys, but, or it may or may not, I shouldn't speak for you. You might know exactly what a recordable is, but yeah. OSHA recordables are big deals. Um, yeah. If you have a, somebody gets injured on the job, if you ever go into any manufacturing facility or anything, they'll look at the number of days since a recordable incident, yep. you know, and that's a very proud thing. Well, if, if, a COVID, if getting COVID at the workplace is a recordable, you'll start looking at that in days, not in weeks, months, or years if, for a great organization. Yeah. Yeah, it can certainly change the way that that employers are looking at how they should be bringing employees back and how do we continue to manufacture certain things, for example. How do we continue to, you know, there's so many unknowns still and it sounds like you guys are on the precipice of figuring some of these things out and I'm excited to ask, you know, more questions about that. But let's take a quick break to hear a word from one of our sponsors and then we'll get into that. Great. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today, so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. All right, we're back, Tycoons. All right, Michael, I got to (laughs) ask, where did the name Yellowbird come from? Great question. Great question. I, uh, I, I get that a lot. And I am not smart enough to come up with Yellowbird myself. I'll tell you that. Uh, the original name was Zip EHS. Um, in fact, I still have a couple of legal documents that have Zip EHS on it. And Zip being, you know, Zip Recruiter and 
zip everything uh, yeah. fast. EHS being our vertical, um, pigeonholing my company and having no else that we could possibly go after this. Um, when we went through the Coplex program, and we talked about Coplex earlier, uh, we went through the accelerator program at, at Coplex. And um, first thing we did was a branding exercise and um, went through my, you know, went through with my team colors that we liked and representing safety and they, it's a really fun exercise. If you've ever, never done a true branding exercise with a great organization, um, they really did. They, they opened my eyes to, there was all sorts of directions we could go um, for animals and colors and, and what did you want the feeling of Yellowbird to be? Like I, I kept repeating that I want, I want my pros to have freedom. I want my pros to be able to, if they're an Arizona professional and they want to go to Alaska in the middle of the summertime and, and, uh, and provide a training or um, provide a service on, on, for an Alaska company that it gives them freedom. Right. So, and they came back with a bunch of different names and um, I'm actually going to give this credit to uh, my kids, both Nick and Josie said, yellow bird. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And I'm like, no, I don't like it. And they're like, no, <laughs> dad, you, you think about it. You know? And so uh, we were at dinner um, with my wife and my kids and um, it, uh, it stuck. And the more I talk to people, you know, it's just descriptive enough, um, but not so descriptive that, uh, that you um, can't really make the leap of what we do. And we can go into other verticals. I'm not going to for quite some time. We're doing very well in our vertical. We're staying focused. But if we did want to go into some other type of professional gig economy platform, um, you could do it under the Yellowbird name. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, the, that's the story. <laughs> very cool. I, I actually just... Uh, just some, some quick contacts so, so you have an understanding before I say this. But so Austin and I, we, we both have our own individual practices and then we have our joint practice together. And so he's got his own marketing name. I have my own marketing name. And I just went through an entire rebrand myself. So I, I didn't have the, uh, I wasn't fortunate enough to, um, you know, go through and use a company like Coplex. I kind of bootstrapped a lot of it. but I did read a really great book by a guy named Jeremy Miller, I believe, and it was called Brand New Name. Huh. So if you ever have to, you know, rename a company or name a company, it's a great uh, starting point. But um, so you mentioned that you guys primarily cover uh, manufacturing and what was the other? And construction. Uh, construction. Construction. So do you cover other? industries or are those just really the two that you focus on right now? No, it's a great question. So it's, it's really hard. So if you ever raise money or, or if you're involved in any uh, professional consulting, what they always tell you to do is stay very focused, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. You can't be everything to everybody. And the only way to own a market is to really own it. Now the problem is an EHS and it's actually EHS and S it's environmental health, safety and sustainability. You cover everything from um, environmental surveys, uh, phase ones, phase twos, land surveys, things like mold and um, remediation services, to OSHA compliance and even safe forklift uh, use and certifications. I mean, it covers a broad range. And so for us, we had to choose a beachhead client base to focus on. And so we looked at the OSHA um, and um, environmental issues that have happened in certain states and certain areas. And so what we did is we went through the reportables and we went through the, basically it's all public record. And we said, okay, where are the areas that obviously have one, the highest uh, incident and or casualty rates, which are very unfortunate, but it's an area we can make an impact. And then the other opportunity for us is uh, decentralization. So the one thing that you'll find is the organizations that are running well are running well within a confine of their campus and or their building. And so, yes, they'll still need professionals on demand for their niche needs. Um, I need somebody to come in and do a training for X. I want somebody to come and do a COVID plan for us. And that can be done anywhere. But the groups that we've been most successful with are we're starting a project and it is 250 miles outside of town and we still have people that have to be here. We need localization. 
and construction has that a lot. Um, that's really the area that I think has the most opportunity for us um, from a, just a vertical perspective is the construction and then of course oil and gas. And we're not focused there right now for obvious reasons. It's a, it's a tough market in the oil and gas field right now. Yeah, I've heard something about the cost of oil being pretty low these days. <laughs> Actually, right, Landon? Actually, it's gone up quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> recently. <laughs> yeah. yeah, recently, yes. <laughs> um, so earlier you said that, you know, you guys are really in the business of matching pros with codes. Yes. Right? And yes. so that makes me think of a staffing agency. So mm -hmm. easy question. Are you a staffing agency? It's, a, it's an appropriate question, and it's a, it's a question, my number one question that we get. No, we're not. And so... And there's nothing wrong with staffing agencies, and I always have to start it this way because it's been an industry that has, that has done the heavy lifting for organizations for years. The process of finding qualified, vetted, um, temporary and or full-time employees has been to search them down, ask people if they're available for work, do the background check, do the vetting, present them to the HR manager and or the, the uh, internal um, hiring manager, and then go through that process to get that person hired. And it's, it's worked and it does well. And, and 10 years ago, we never would have had this conversation. The challenge with it is it is a commission-based, um, you know, kill what you eat or eat what you kill. <laughs> 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 you would eat what you kill uh, structure. And so a lot of very hardworking placement people work out, working on the comms. So they're basically out there doing their jobs and they will get between, um, you know, four months and nine months plus of salary when that person is hired. So it's a, it's a commission-based deal. And that is fine, except the challenge is, is that in the part-time or the gig economy environment, what they do is they have hooks. And so they'll say, yeah, we can find somebody for you temporarily, um, but you can't hire them full-time. And for us, first of all, we're bringing on professionals in advance. So we have a pool of professionals that are already vetted. They've already been checked on their backgrounds. We've already gone through their certifications. We know that they can do the job. And so we can match somebody in hours, not days, weeks, or months. So that's the first, well, yeah, no brainer. Um, the second value proposition is if you like that person and you want to hire them, we do not have a hiring fee. Now people are like, oh, wow, you're, you're foregoing a huge revenue opportunity. And to a large degree, we are. However, if you've chosen to hire that person, you still have to put them through that days, weeks, and months process with your HR to get them on board. Hopefully, you'll continue using them through Yellowbird, so we will um, be able to um, reap the, the matching fee, essentially what we charge, and during that period of time. And then in the scenario that we have modeled, and I think it is accurate, that person will now be using Yellowbird for their future um, needs. And so we will have to constantly show our value, but it's a specialty industry and it's not a small industry. It's a $55 billion industry. People don't realize the size of the market that we're talking about, but it is a niche industry. You, one day you can need somebody to do hazardous materials for all those barrels of oil and fuels and chemicals you have in the warehouse. And a week later you could have somebody in to do CPR training for your folks because you had somebody who had a heart attack and you want to get CPR trainers. That's all under eh &S. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like a, an efficient way to do it. I mean, it makes me think of those dating apps that Landon used to be on, you know, <laughs> swipe left, swipe right type of a, of a deal before he met his lovely wife, Tia. Hey, at least it was before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have time for dating now with those two twins at home. Oh, man. Yeah, funny, funny story about dating uh, apps. I'll have to share with you uh, offline, uh, Michael. <laughs> But um, so, yeah, so talk to us a little bit about actually, you know what, let me, let me take one quick step back. So something that's been a really, really cool theme on this show, and it's not not by design by any means, but a really cool theme that I have I've been seeing develop is that a lot of the people that we've had on this show, um, it's almost as if they their businesses were perfectly positioned to operate and, and thrive in this new world, this new environment that we are all living in these days. So I, I feel like that is going to be the same for you and for Yellowbird, but talk to us a little bit about um, how COVID has changed your business, your model, and your, your plans kind of moving forward. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of hard. You know, there are a lot of people who are struggling, and so I, I really I have a hard time with the question, not because you've asked it, not because I don't want to answer it, but I also I I don't like being boastful and just in general it just doesn't it, it never is a good feeling um we are have been very well positioned and we've pivoted our our ehns um services towards industrial hygiene specifically return to work plans so we're helping a lot of people in that process we also were in the right cycle of our raise um there are organizations in town here who raised a bunch of money to scale they've hired a ton of people they moved into big office spaces and so forth and then COVID hit and slowed their growth down significantly and put them in a bad position purely out of no, no fault of their own. It just happened to be a timing thing. So I'm very fortunate to have good timing. Um, good timing not to have grown fast, I guess. Um, no, no, we have grown very fast. I just started early. I started later than they did. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, we've got a lot of tailwind right now. We have, uh, you know, we're growing at uh, 6x uh, quarter over quarter right now, which is amazing. Um, you know, we blew right past the numbers that we had forecasted. And in fact, our forecasted quarterly numbers were hitting this month um, in one month. So it's, it's really a very, uh, a wonderful thing. And I have an excellent team. That being said, we're also reassessing everything. I, I just uh, um, leased some space and we got a very good deal because it was during COVID and so forth. Um, but even the space that we that we lease, we don't need all that space right now because there's a few people working from home for quite some time. Yeah. I've got uh, seven employees, and and in that seven people, we uh, we have folks that are, you know, they are um, skittish about returning. We've got a couple of employees that have health related matters that they um, want to make absolutely certain that they're in a good position, and I don't blame them at all whatsoever. We also had plans of opening offices as our growth strategy very similar to an Uber or a Lyft or any of these traditional gig economy companies, which the way that they've grown historically, um, cause I, I've known some of those folks and I've, I've studied what they've done is they, they open, you know, three to four person offices and they take ownership of that market. And so they've got a general manager and somebody on the supply side, somebody on the demand side. Well, we had planned on doing that same thing. Well, now that we've been able to go nationwide, we have placed people nationwide now. Um, you know, we've grown during this time without offices. We're kind of raising an eyebrow a little bit and saying, okay, are we going to need to? Are we going to just grow here in Scottsdale in Phoenix area? And um, we will open regional offices. It's going to be necessary to support the teams. But, you know, we're, we're looking at everything. It's changing. <laughs> it's yeah. changing the nature of even what we've do, done for the first six months of the year. Yeah, I think I think every business out there is is assessing whether or not their real estate needs will continue the way that they were pre-COVID, oh, right? right? And and I think that you're you're likely right that you're going to want people in different regions throughout the country, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to need them inside of an office space that you leased, right? Right? And so it, it just really depends. Every industry is different. Some people you do absolutely need manufacturing space or office space or whatever and other industries you just don't yeah and every business is out there assessing that now and you know one of the things that you said was you know landon asked you how things were going during covid and and you know how your business has been affected either positively or negatively and you used the term you know we we pivoted mm -hmm. right and it's funny because it just keeps coming up and maybe it's just a coplex thing but you know brenda schmidt was on several weeks ago yeah, and, i know brenda yeah, and she she talked about persevere, pivot, or perish. Right. right. Yes. And businesses are constantly, or need to constantly, be looking at everything that they're doing and saying, "Do we persevere in what we're doing and the plan that we're following right now, or do we need to pivot, or are we just done? Is this not going to work?" Right. And unfortunately, in this economy, with everything that's gone on with COVID, there are a lot of businesses that are just they're just going to perish. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right? Yeah. And, and and it's like you said, it's not through any fault of their own. They've they've run businesses that had millions in revenue. Everything was great pre-COVID. And then all of a sudden, it's like somebody sh shut off the faucet mm -hmm. and they don't have anywhere to pivot to. Right. Unless they go to a different industry completely, for example. It's about, it is a balance sheet world right now. It really is. People that have strong balance sheets. Now, of course, small companies like ours, I mean, balance sheets are 
a humorous statement, you know, <laughs> but it balances. There's just not many zeros on it right yeah. now, right? <laughs> but, you know, if you were conservatively running, you weren't overextended, you have access to capital and you have access to be able to, to operate. Even if you have to make hard decisions, you can survive. If you don't have a strong balance sheet and you are overextended and your revenues, your cash flow, cash in, cash out kind of company, it's going to be a hard run. And um, there are companies that won't, won't survive. Fortunately, again, there are organizations that are getting the support from their investors. Uh, that organization that I was thinking of earlier, and I won't mention them by name, but they were killing it. They happen to be in a bad market and, or a market that was heavily hit. And um, I know you're going to be wondering who it is, but it's, basic, it's basically focus, it's focusing on the entertainment and the hospitality and restaurant industry. Yeah. Great company, great people, um, and just bad timing. And yeah. so their investors have actually supported them. And I think at the other end of this, they're going to be just fine. Um, there are organizations that don't have access to capital. Yeah. And it's going to be, it's going to be tough for them. Yeah, there, there's no doubt. I mean, most small businesses in this country don't have the balance sheet to be able to weather something like exactly. this, even if they're able to pivot. Sure. Right. And, sure. and what most people don't realize is even restaurants, most of the restaurants that yeah. we frequent that have household names are individually owned by small business owners. Oh, yeah. And they don't have the balance sheet to weather this. They don't have the balance sheet to figure out how to operate on 25% or 50% occupancy. And so there's so many things that are, that are going on right now that business owners need to be able to, to get through. So, but there, but there are things, okay. I know people are going to call me a half full kind of guy, but I, get, I am half full kind of guy. There are things that people are figuring out um, that, you know, has been amazing. Like I've walked into, I, um, I live in uh, North Scottsdale and there is a, um, a healthy dining visit, um, place out there that, that, I'll go to occasionally by my office on Shea. And their to-go is stacked. They have pivoted and they have, you know, their customers love their food. They love what they do. The people, you know, now there are fine dining establishments. I don't know what they're going to do and I am concerned yeah. about them. But there's a lot of pivoting going on. There's also a lot of things like food trucks and um, patio situations and shared you know, kitchens. Shared kitchens, exactly. Yep. There's a lot of things that people are it's fast forwarding innovation. I think this is going to be when people look back at this, the fast forwarding of innovation. And I'm not just talking Zoom because everybody knows Zoom did a great job. Sure. Oh, and they didn't. And then they did. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but but they, they still stumbled. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? They also, I, I, I give a lot of credit because can you imagine having your business grow at 10,000% over a weekend? Yeah. And they didn't go offline. I mean, yeah, they had a security problem and that's a big problem. Don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling it, but yep. nobody talked about how nobody can make zoom calls and everything crashed and nothing worked. It all worked. It just maybe worked with a little less security than it should have. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. So I, I've got plenty more questions to ask you about uh, COVID-19 and kind of where, you know, where you go from here, but sure. let's take a quick break to hear from our second sponsor and then we'll get into that. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, Tycoons, we're back for the last segment uh, with Michael Zal here in studio with Yellowbird. And, and Michael, I think the conversation so far has been phenomenal. I appreciate the, uh, your responses and, and just, you know, feedback. As, as you know, this, this program is really, you know, it's by small business owners for small business owners, mm -hmm. right? So it gives you, you an opportunity to tell your story, of course. And, you know, if that helps you from a marketing standpoint, then all the better. We, we love that. Great. Um, but there are also listeners that pick up, you know, some tidbits from you and different things that you're doing that, oh, man, maybe I should be doing that myself. And so, you know, b before we jump into kind of your advice for the business owners that are listening, and then we'll end with you telling us a little bit about, you know, how we can reach you and website address, those sorts of things. But I want to talk specifically today about raising capital <laughs> in this environment, which, you know, I'm not raising capital. I've raised capital in the past, and I couldn't imagine raising capital in this environment. So give us some feedback on, on what things look like. It's not that there's nobody out there that has money that they're willing to invest, but, you know, what does it look like today? What's the environment like? You know, the, the rules don't change. They really don't. Um, the process of raising capital is, <laughs> as much as, it, as people hate to say this, it's the same as dating. And you, you, 
can't just ask one lady or, or man out and think that they're going to be the one, you know, you, you have to uh, talk to a lot of people, find out the match. So I know a fair amount about private equity investing and I know a fair amount about venture capital. And, you know, there's a first and foremost, talk to the right people. And when I say talk to the right people, understand the investor's thesis. So every VC, every investor has a thesis, what they want to invest in and what they don't. And so they're trying to see if there's a match, a love match, basically. It actually works like a marketplace. It truly yeah. does. Yeah. Um, and the process used to be, and it still is, you send an investor deck. You, If they like what they see in the initial deck, they ask you for a meeting. Um, you go through, or maybe you do a one-pager and then they ask you for a meeting. But before you get the meeting, they'll ask you for a full deck. Um, and uh, you maybe present or maybe you just talk to the deck. And at the end of that process, um, and generally speaking, that process was done face-to-face. -face, so it's very regionalized, not anymore, yep. which has been a way that's accelerated during this process in this industry. Uh, this COVID situation has helped um, helped in that sense is that there are deals being closed right now over Zoom. And yeah. nobody ever thought that would, would happen. I mean, you know, before we cut checks, we absolutely have to see, see somebody face-to-face. -face. Not anymore. Um, and I, I think that will forever be changed. However, I will say this, that... Um, it, the scrutiny on a business right now is tough. It really is. You can have, you know, my co-founder is an Intel executive for 26 years. Our chief product officer is um, is a gentleman that worked at, um, he sold a business to eBay. He worked at eBay for six years. He was at Amazon. He's responsible for product. You don't get better than him. No. Our pedigrees, fortunately, with our team is are exceptional. And we... It is a long, slow, arduous process, and it is no different for me than anybody else. Um, it, you need to know your you need to know your stuff, yeah. and that hasn't changed. The difference is is that you get to know real quickly um, if the business is viable, both for yourself, even if you're kind of kidding yourself, um, because fortunately we're not. But if you didn't have a real strong sense of who you are and what you do and what and how you can justify what you're offering. Um, it could be really hard right now Yeah, because the who you're competing with is not other new ventures. Who you're competing with are other viable ventures that are running out of cash that need reinvestment. So you get a lot of, I'm sorry, I've allocated for follow-on investment because I still believe in these guys and they need more capital. Yeah. So now you're competing with somebody that they've already funded once instead of, never, instead of being the new kid in town. However, the difference is, is that if you have tailwinds from a COVID play, um, and when I say tailwinds from a COVID play, I don't mean that you are in the COVID business, but your business aligns with a COVID message, yeah. you can do very well. And that's what we've been fortunate enough to do. We pivoted our organization into industrial hygiene and specifically a return to work program nationwide where we're doing a, a formal return to work program for businesses. It's turnkey. We've got people all over the country. I think we're up to 700 or something like that, professionals that can do this nationwide. It's also localized. And so we go to the investment community and say, during this uncertain time, we are going to be able to um, grow our business. And we have with the COVID markets. And by the way, the same person who buys the COVID service is in, is in the environmental health and safety. They're also our customer in the future who still needs the training, who still needs the plans written, who still needs an OSHA assessment, still needs a walkthrough and so forth. Yeah. No, I, th I think you're right about that. I mean, obviously, anytime you put your company out there and you're meeting with VCs or, you know, private equity groups, they're going to be the first people that are going to poke a hole in the, in the business plan that you've put together. Oh, yeah. And so you, either, you better know your stuff, first of all. And if, if it's not a viable business, and, and granted, sometimes private equity folks think that it's not a viable business and, and they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. plenty of organizations go on to be successful. Absolutely. Right? And VCs. Yeah. They miss, they miss the ball as often as they hit it. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, yeah. <laughs> as a VC investor, you know that your, your chances of hitting it big are, are really, really slim. Yeah. Right. But they are smart individuals that help you kind of poke holes in your business plan and decide, help you decide whether or not it really is viable or to fix some of the holes that are there so that you are more viable going forward. So I, I think it's great to, to hear different stories about how people are approaching that world today, yeah. raising capital. And for me personally, and I, I won't speak for Landon, but just understanding that one, you can pivot today, but also knowing that these, even though you're pivoting, you still have a long-term customer here 
because the return to work may not be forever. No, right? no, it's not. But you have plenty of customers that are still in that area where you have other opportunities to serve those customers. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting for, for, from my perspective, I look at it in twofold. I think COVID has helped us um, launch the return to work program, which is very important. And I, everybody talks about your why, right? You know, the Simon Sinek deal, but at the end of the day, my why is serving the worker. And so if I can help workers get back to work and actually be safe, um, then I'm absolutely doing my job and I'm excited about that. What it's also going to do is people are not going to be quote unquote living on airplanes, which is what used to happen in, in EHS because it's a high income role. You know, an average EHS person makes, you know, they'll, they'll make 80 grand, 90 grand, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And so, and, and it goes way up from there. Sure. And so you can't have those people everywhere. You truly can't. And so from, from my perspective, I like the regionalization. I like the localization of, um, of professionals. So if you look at um, what it would take to have somebody in Denver or somebody in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or somebody in Canada, um, and you're headquartered in Phoenix, well, it's a lot of logistics. Yeah. There's a lot that has to be done there. Sure. So. Yeah. So you help solve that problem for these employers so that they don't have to personally have them in each area, but they know that they can call up Yellowbird and mm -hmm. Yellowbird's going to have somebody for them. Yep. And they'll have somebody quickly and they'll be more qualified than they can find themselves. Yeah. And that's our goal. You know, we have to be better, we have to be faster, and we have to be more cost effective. Yeah. And those are our three. Those, I mean, better being number one. We have to have the better person. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the hardest part of the process is making sure that you properly vetted the people. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that's all I have. Landon, anything you want to ask before we have him tell us how to reach Yellowbird? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I'm excited. I was hoping that we had just a couple minutes at the uh -oh. end here so uh -oh. that I could ask you about this. So yeah. one of the things that Austin and I help a lot of our clients with is doing succession and exit planning. So you have successfully exited out of a couple of companies, or I know you've been involved in that um, in the past. So yep. can you give our listeners a couple of tips and tricks as to what you have learned working with private equity, venture firms, exiting business, and just all the experience that you have? <laughs> wow. <laughs> just, we only have yeah, five minutes. We got, we got two, <laughs> in two minutes. Okay. No problemo. No, you got 90 seconds. Go. <laughs> you know, I guess the honest answer is, is that there is no um, one way. And so I'll give you an example. I just had a fantastic phone call with a gentleman who um, he is a, a VC out of New York and he um, has been very gracious. I had no idea his experience other than he's just a, a really kind and, and gracious guy. He's been looking into us and um, was introduced by a friend of a friend. And turns out that he is a 20-year venture, venture capitalist who left the VC world to go travel the world with his fiance for, for a, a year. And now they've got a baby at home. And he's starting to look into getting back into starting a VC again, or at least two VC investments. And through the experience of talking with him, you know, and you wouldn't know this guy. He's very unpretentious. He's just a, a really cool cat. And in talking with him, it just reminded me of how important it is to know your priorities and how important it is to understand that, hey, God, I'm going to sound like such a cliche. It's, but it, it truly is a journey. It really is a journey. And, and, you know, you're all going to have bad days. We're all going to have good days, but these little, these little, uh, you know, moments of, of greatness. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, um, give a shout out to, uh, there's a lady that works for us. Her name's Abby Berenholtz and Abby is exceptional. And she created a um, thing for us, part of our cultural doctrine that we have internally. And we're, we're big about culture. And, um, and one of those is be spicy. Uh, <laughs> and one of them is uh, be awesome and uh, being a lifelong learner and so forth. But she created a website. It's a, it's, it's a, and I highly recommend it. And this is if anybody takes anything away from today, other than um, that, they should all use Yellowbird. Um, is, uh, <laughs> is, um, um, it's just a little web uh, type form that was done on Google, and it was called the Small Moments Jar. And it was, it left, it put our, our list of our core values, 
and it gave the name of the person and what they did that rocked their world today and how and which core value it represented. And at the end of each month, she re, and she sends them off anonymously um, to the whole team. And you just read these things and there's just a couple of moments in there that I'm like, wow, you know, I've got this, this awesome culture going on here. And so the, my word of wisdom, and this is not a financial word of wisdom, it's a, it's a life word um, moment of wisdom, which is, you know, letting the people around you know that you are proud of them and that you care about them and that you, whatever they've accomplished for the day is so important. It's so easily overlooked, <laughs> including myself. Um, and um, from an exit perspective, you never make as much money as you think you're going to, and you never feel as good as you um, think you're going to when you get a big check. Um, it doesn't suck. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> <laughs> but it's money. And you know, money is, it, it, it's, it's solves a lot of problems, but it doesn't solve all your problems. And so I would say that um, understanding why you're doing it and, you know, in the end of the day, when you, after you get the check or whatever it is that you do, you still have to wake up in the morning and do something. I mean, are you going to be the uh, Uber driver and driving around and saying, what am I going to do with the rest of my day? Uh, I couldn't handle it. I will never, I will never retire personally. Yeah. It's just never going to happen. Yeah. Well, the first thing you need to do when you get the check is you call Austin and myself and then <laughs> figure out, then you figure out what you're going to do after that. But uh, no, wait, wait, call who? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you broke up there. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> uh, I'm a little confused actually, because what he should have said is, Two years before you think you're yeah. going to exit, uh, you should be doing proper planning with Austin and Landon <laughs> so that you exit the right way. But, you know, I, I'll tell you one of the things that you did hit on, and, and you think it's a, a person's thing or a people, you know, a culture thing, which it absolutely is. And that's really what's most important. But what you're talking about is really empowering your employees to do what they do best. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, Unfortunately, or fortunately, on the flip side, what that does for you is the less your business is dependent on you personally to uh -huh. run, the more it's worth. And so you're really killing two birds, two yellow birds, maybe uh -huh. with, with one stone by doing that. So <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Not my first rodeo, Michael. <laughs> hey, Michael. Right. Yeah. Really, really, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, you're interesting dude seem like a really good dude you care about your business you care about people you care about doing the right thing so it's been uh, our totally our pleasure having you on the show really appreciate you making the time to come out and talk to us um tell our listeners um how do they how do they find you how do they contact you what's the best way for them to get in touch with you i appreciate it and thank you for that was really kind i thank you for that that was a really nice thing you, uh, for you to say um well, we're on all the social media outlets. It's all Go Yellowbird, um, G-O Yellowbird. Um, so hashtag Go Yellowbird and uh, Twitter and um, LinkedIn and all of those are Go Yellowbird. In fact, the website is www.goyellowbird.com. And then I'm on, um, I'm on social media. Um, my best route to find me, honestly, I'm not on many social medias other than LinkedIn. Um, and it's Michael, uh, Michael Zal, Z-A-L-L-E. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I love to connect with people. I'm very, very interested in helping um, with the HS. And so obviously if you're in construction or you, or if you're a professional that wants to do some consulting, all we ask is that you sign up. There's no obligation and there's no obligation on the company side either. And our goal is that we make money when you make money and that we make it easier for the process um, and lets you basically say yes or no to an opportunity. And so that's my goal here is um, if you're a professional out there that has an EHS skill and certification, um, sign up on goyelber.com and be willing to uh, say yes um, to some gig at some point. And if you don't, by the way, there's no penalization. I get that asked a lot. Um, uh, this is not a stick kind of an environment. It's a carrot environment. So we're going to keep offering the carrots and eventually you'll want to you'll bite one. <laughs> fantastic fantastic well michael we sure appreciate you coming on man and uh we certainly look forward to having you back on the show sometime uh you know early mid part next year to hear what you're up to love it i'm happy to be there you guys have been great and thank you for having me all right thanks a lot man you 
have been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. Hey, now we did, it. we did it. That was so good. What'd you think, huh? It was great. It really was. That was what? awesome. Yeah, really great. You'll have to put your headset back on, otherwise, Landon, you won't be able to hear Landon, and he always has something, you know, in, incredible to say at the end, right, Landon? Oh boy! Absolutely. Yes. As, yes. He put, as he puts food Nod in his, your as head. He puts yes. food in his no mouth. pressure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, give me the word of wisdom. This is this is gonna change my life. Wow, okay, what's okay. happening? Now? I will never do that again. So sorry. <laughs> Can you blow a bubble? Is that gum? It is not gum. It's just a mint. <laughs> Good. My Good. my Good. word of wisdom is. Um, do not have twins in the middle of a global health <laughs> oh, oh, Good word of wisdom. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed smooth it. smooth and yeah, the, the camaraderie fun. was really neat to watch. And We should have some beers next time or some wine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So it, that's what we love. We love to hear people say, I want to stay connected with our hosts. And, and obviously that's, that's a good portion of why we do what we do, because we, we want to run in the, the right circle with the right people. Uh, I'm going to take our um, video view off right. here, and I should probably shut off the recording as well. So the um, rocket.